here we are. New episode. Uh, new season. Possibly a new intro. I say that because I am recording this before the new intro has been completed. We intend to have a new intro for Babylon 5 Season 2. Hopefully it's there. Hopefully you liked it. Because, <laughs> uh. So, <clears throat> I had a few things to talk about before we jump into the episode proper. <coughs> well, first of all, something I've been meaning to talk about for a while, and I really feel like this is probably the best time to really go into this idea. I really hope I haven't talked about this before. If so, forgive me. Oh, my memory is not as what it used to be. I want to talk about trapdoors. <clears throat> trapdoors is what JMS calls them, and I've kind of adopted his lingo on the matter. And I agree with the philosophy behind it. In fact, it's something I try to emulate in my own works. Basically all the time. In a television series especially, <clears throat> actors go away. Sometimes contracts don't get renewed. Sometimes people just want to quit. You know, the Tashi R situation is a good example of how not to do a trapdoor, uh, for example. <coughs> so, trapdoors, <clears throat> in brief, is when you have plans in mind just in case things go badly. In other words, if you're doing a show, <clears throat> or a game, or a book, or a movie, or whatever, where you have this big, long, in depth plan for how things are going to go, in other words, something like string continuity, like Babylon 5 is. You have plans for when things go badly, because things will go badly. Things will screw up. You know, the unexpected will happen. You know, what if someone got into an accident? What if someone uh, couldn't record for a few weeks at a time during a critical juncture? You know, you need some kind of plan in mind in order to deal with the unexpected. And that's what a trapdoor is in a nutshell. Oh, okay. Psh, okay, fixed. <clears throat> Problem removed. Um, now... The point of trapdoors is to kind of hit the, the balance point in between dynamic storytelling and planned storytelling. Now, I've made my point many, 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 many times clear that I am a huge, huge fan of planned storytelling. I like a story that's written pretty much all of the way through before you even start the first episode, book, chapter, game, you know, whatever. I like stuff that's planned in advance. Uh, the Kingdom Hearts series from, t from Chain of Memories onwards. Babylon 5 itself. Um, the Suikoden series, which I recently looked at. You know, a lot of this was all planned way in advance, so they, and it, the advantages of that are A, it's going to look much better when you actually analyze it, because you'll see how the pieces fit together. B, at least in my opinion, it will look better at a casual view, because at this point you could see how the world, even if you're not literally noticing the connecting points, the world will feel more alive and more like a world than like a show, for example, because of the fact that there's these little things that just keep cropping up all over the place that help tie it all together. <clears throat> and C, the fact that you can do lots more with foreshadowing if you know what's happening next. One of the biggest uh, complaints I've heard several writers talk about on TNG on Voyager was the fact that the writers wanted to leave hints for the future. And occasionally they would, but those hints would not be followed through on because of the nature of the show. They wanted those plot threads to be picked up. They wanted to do something with it in the future. So they left it dangling as like an option, and then of course the option was never taken. But you can do foreshadowing that pays off if you have everything planned, and that's the big thing. And I think, and I, I don't want to compare this to Star Trek directly. That's not really my intention. <clears throat> but to use a direct example, the episode Conspiracy, TNG, Season 1. That episode never paid off. Now, it was intended to, and I'll talk about this when we get to TNG, but it never actually paid off. They left foreshadowing, and then nothing ever happened. That's much less, less of an impact than foreshadowing, and then it actually pays off. Now, granted, that wasn't really foreshadowing. That was like blatant, duh, to be continued kind of thing. But the point still remains. If you do foreshadowing and it doesn't pay off, it actually actively has a negative impact, as opposed to if you've done nothing at all. <clears throat> if you have a planned storyline, you can pay it off eventually, and that's the important part, the buildup and the payoff. I talked about build-up and whatnot in my last episode when we talked about Season 1. Uh, so these trapdoor things make perfect sense. Like, for example, in this exact case, you know, with Michael O'Hare, it was something that was basically unavoidable. But it's not just if things go wrong that trapdoors are useful for. And this is why I preach this uh, to as many uh, fledgling writers or, or learning writers out there as I can. Because when you use a trapdoor, let's say you're writing a story, and I can speak from personal experience on this. Let's say you've written a story 
and you want it to be canon with your future works, like I have, for example, the Imperium. I've had to go back and fix a lot of my older stories to make them, to be blunt, better, because I was a kid when I started writing the Imperium. You know, I was literally in my teenage years. <clears throat> And I need, you know, I, I want to have a better uh, story. Like now, if I was doing trap doors back then, and I do this nowadays, if I change my mind on a character, if I feel like a character isn't working, if I notice that the audience isn't really receiving a character particularly well, then I have a trap door already in place, so that even though the overall thread of the arc can continue, this char this one character or this these few characters or this one thread can be dropped and replaced in lore. And that's the big significance of a trap door, and something that I've noticed some people don't quite get the point of. It's easy enough to do what most other television shows do and just recast. Imagine if uh, Bruce Brock's Lightner. I hope I'm pronouncing his name right there, uh, shows up one day and he's just playing Sinclair. And nobody even bats an eyelash because he's Sinclair. Now, that if that sounds weird to you, then, then I'm amused because that means you're probably pretty young. Because that used to be a fairly common thing in television. They just recast. And everyone would just kind of be like, yep. It was usually the uncommon thing where they would recast and have it be a new character. Uh, TNG's Pulaski is actually a good example of that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um... So the fact that you have a brand new character in lore is a nice thing. It's and, and there's plenty of ways to do this. You don't need some big explanation every time. For example, like those characters, the the, the, the three or so characters in, in the pilot, <clears throat> which went away when the first episode came out. Those three characters, they didn't. Ha they just basically said, oh, they got transferred back to Earth, and the quiet implication was always left. <coughs> was always left there, that those characters were transferred because of the fact that they happened to interact with the Vorlon, thereby adding to the mystique of the Vorlons. And I like that. It's a, it's a little thing. It doesn't have to be some big complicated thing, but that is a trapdoor in action. And I like that. I like that concept. Uh, and I, like I said, I, I preach it to every, uh, to every uh, writer out there. Let's talk about Michael O'Hare really briefly. Uh, I know I've already covered this. <clears throat> but Michael O'Hare basically had to bow out of the show. He had mental health issues suffered from delusions and some paranoiac issues. And I don't mean that as in, oh, he's paranoid. I mean in the literal mental health sense of the word. And it was giving him some very severe problems, and he was basically just struggling to even get season one done. And my heart goes out to the man. He was a true champion. Apparently, the massive positive reaction from fans and whatnot is part of what helped him to keep going, helped him to, to maintain that will and drive. But by the end of season one, it was just too much, and he had to bow out. And by that point in time, the show was doing well enough that they had the backing to go ahead and replace the main character. Um, <clears throat> now, I'm going to talk a little bit about Sheridan versus Sinclair. I hate to add that versus there, but you know how that goes. First of all, I want to say something, though. <clears throat> I don't know if you understand how unusual this is in context. Nowadays, you know, in more modern television, television tends to be a little bit more casual about doing things that back in the days, back in the 80s, 90s, 70s, and early 2000s, was considered completely out of bounds. For example, changing the main character of a show. Imagine, if you will, if Voyager... And I, so, to give you a little idea of what I mean, imagine if Picard actually hadn't come back for Season 4 of TNG. Which, for those of you not aware, was actually a real thing. Uh, Patrick Stewart was legitimately thinking about not coming back for that. Imagine the impact that would have had. Imagine if Janeway died in the middle of Voyager. Imagine if... <clears throat> Cisco, you know, ascended or whatever, and uh, Kira had to take over in the middle of DS9. Uh, imagine if John Crichton's had, uh, had finally lost, and everyone else had to pick up the slack from You know, in other words, it's the kind of thing you just don't do. Like all risky ch uh, decisions, I, I, t I tend to be the kind of person who, who applauds risk, but I also freely acknowledge and will always admit that risk is called risk for a reason. Risk does not mean reward. Risk means freaking risk. And it may not pay off. I think Babylon 5 got a little bit lucky, to be a little bit blunt, because they replaced a main character, and it actually worked out. <clears throat> and Babylon 5 was able to go on to be one of the most you know, awesome shows in science fiction history. And in my opinion, the best television show I've ever seen. But I mention this because... It, w it made some pretty big waves at the time, uh, such as it is. Now, it is also worth noting that, and I've decided not to go into the full depths on this, Babylon 5 was having 
weird behind the scenes problems. Um, the companies, yes, plural, that had been pushing them uh, eventually bowed out and they ended up getting picked up by another group who ended up finishing pushing them. And th there's all these details I'm not going to bore you with right now. The bottom line, though, was Babylon 5, it was basically this constant juggling act just to stay on the air. There's a reason they actually uh, almost got cancelled for Season 4, and then got uncancelled, and that led to problems later. <clears throat> Not the only television show to have that problem, I feel like pointing out. But the reason I bring this up here especially, it explains several aspects of this episode. Many people call this episode... <coughs> many people call this episode the second pilot of Babylon 5. And I have heard some people out there legitimately say, start watching the show at Season 2, Episode 1, uh, and start and, and just completely ignore Season 1 and, and the, uh, the, the opening pilot movie. Now, I disagree with that personally, obviously, not just because I like Season 1, but because I feel that that build-up really helps make all of this actually matter. You know, we have establishment, we know who these characters are, we understand the stakes, you know, all those wonderful reasons. But, uh, Part of the reason for that is because of the fact that Season 2 made a very big point to shove a lot of exposition right into the first couple of episodes, just to make sure that new viewers, because there were new viewers, and viewers in general would know what the hell was going on, especially since there's all of a sudden this Sheridan guy, and who the hell is this, and where's Sinclair? Uh, so it's understandable. Uh, I will say, as a bit of a negative, the, there's a lot of artificial dialogue in the exposition. That being said, they do do one thing rather well. Uh, but let's get to that later. Let's keep talking about the behind-the-scenes thing. So I mentioned Michael O'Hare, and again, my heart goes out to him. Um, and I do... L let me go ahead and make my opinion clear. I think he did a good job with Sinclair. I think he came across as a little... I don't want to say flat, because that's not true. <clears throat> and I don't want to say boring, because that's not true either. I've struggled for words to describe Sinclair's performance for many years. It's more calculated, more precise, more planned out. And I don't want to say artificial, because when I think artificial, I think of that jackass on the E3 stage at the EA presentation. The robot who's up there saying things like this. That's not that's not what Michael O'Hare's performance was at all. So I don't, I, and I want to stress, I don't find it as a negative, it's just a way he presented himself, and given Michael O'Hare's issues, that makes perfect sense why he would present the character that way. <clears throat> it also makes sense for the characters. This is another example of taking a problem and running with it. JMS basically turned Sinclair into a bit more of an administrator, more of a diplomat, more of a uh, po political leader. I don't mean a politician in the way we usually mean that in modern days. I mean a politician as in someone who knows how to be political in a good way. Versus Sheridan, who is much, much more the commander type. Like, there's a great quote later about how Sheridan says, I was the only damn victory we had in the entire damn war and I am not going to apologize for it. He has that quote about that. And that, in one sentence, summarizes the difference between Sheridan and Sinclair. Sinclair's the man who will make a hard stance, but reach out a hand to you while he's doing it. Sheridan will take a hard stance and stare at you, waiting for you to make the first move. But again, that helps differentiate the two characters. The administrator, the leader, the politician, and the commander. And Sheridan is much, much more the commander. Um, <clears throat> and so... And I hate myself for saying this, given everything I said, but I have to admit, I do prefer Sheridan over Sinclair. Now, my reasons for that are obvious for anybody who knows anything about me. Sheridan is a lot more affable. Uh, Bruce Broxleitner has a fairly a large amount of charisma about his presentation. And he has this way of just looking human while still managing to look like a hero. He's got what I nowadays refer to as the James Rayner effect. Um... And I like that. I like that in, in his presentation. And Sheridan also has the distinction of being one of a very, very, very small number of fictional characters that if I was in a real-life military, I would be okay with them being my commanding officer. Because, well, I shouldn't have to explain why, but trust me, by the end of this uh, season, or this series, you'll understand why I say that. Um... So I do, I do very, very much like uh, Sheridan, and I do like Sheridan more than Sinclair, but... I will also admit that the reason I don't like that versus there is because of the fact that I don't think it is applicable any more than it's applicable to have Picard versus Kirk. 
for the to use the age-old example. They are different captains with different styles in different eras, under different creative staff, with different writers, by different actors, in different circumstances, and I could just keep going. I could just keep coming up with different ways that they are different. Different, 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 different. I'm trying to say that word enough so I lose all meaning for it. Um, <clears throat> I like both of them. I like Sinclair, and I like Sheridan. And I think their two styles were deliberately shifted away, because it's clear Sinclair was originally supposed to be the commander, and you can really see that in, like, the first three or so episodes of Season 1. But by the time we got to the end of Season 1, it became much more clear he was shifting over to the Administrator. This is another excellent way that they kind of emphasize this in this episode, even though Sinclair is not even in this episode, because we have the Captain's Log with uh, Ivanova, which I'll talk about the Captain's Log in just a second where she talks about and showcases through through great presentation just what a mess it is trying to keep this place clean and safe and you know running and we get the very strong impression that a Sinclair, <clears throat> excuse me, that it's this horribly difficult job keeping this place running and that makes and, and I like that because that makes perfect sense Imagine a multicultural thing in real life and how difficult it would be managing that, especially at a military outpost. Now imagine a multicultural, multi-species, and you kind of see the problems involved there. And B, the second point it gets across very well is it showcases how amazing of an administrator that Sinclair actually was, that he kept things running, that he actually kept the engines going and the gears turning and managed to keep all the different ambassadors and all the different markets and all the different under things and all the military all of that uh, smoothly operating says a lot for his ability. And that's a nice touch. I, I wanted to talk about the Captain's Log thing. We don't see Captain's Log often in Babylon 5. Most people uh, that I talk to aren't actually aware of this, so forgive me for saying this if you know about this and you're going to be like, well, duh. The Captain's Log is an exposition device. That's actually why it was invented. The point was, we need to establish what we're doing in the episode quickly and efficiently. And they came up with this Captain's Log idea to basically be like, we are now doing this, and here's the premise. In a quick, easy, easily to digest chunk that enables to know exactly what's happening quickly and smoothly. There are a few other times where a log, in, you know, in the Captain's Log style, you know, Chief Engineer's Log or whatever, has been used to kind of... Uh, <clears throat> segue scenes, but for the most part that is its purpose, the expositional thing. This is one of the few really good examples of that in Babylon 5, in my opinion, where Ivanova is giving her log, and basically gives a bit of an info dump, info dump over a montage of what's going on on the station, again, for people who either haven't been with it or are just catching up, or are new viewers. I like that. Um, I like how Sinclair is permanently assigned to Minbar. At this point in time, the Minbari have formally dropped all pretense of their interest in Sinclair. And I like the fact that they're just like, no, he's he's with us now. No, seriously. No, he can live here permanently. We're cool with that. Yes, we know that's an incredibly weird thing to do culturally, but we're still doing it. And of course, Earth is okay with this because they're desperately trying to improve relations with Mimbar. Very logical. Um, I do also want to say that, so I, I know I'm skipping ahead of my notes here a little bit, but they finally reveal the truth of the Battle of the Line. I, we can finally talk about the fact except we can't talk about all of the fact, uh, about the fact that human souls and Mimbari souls are the same. Um, I want to talk about that a little bit here, because first of all, I find myself very much wondering what the original version of this script was going to be like, the one which still included Sinclair as commander of the station. Because I'm curious what Sinclair, like, what his reaction would be to that. Obviously, he does learn this. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me that in character... Sinclair goes to Minbar, and then one of the first things he learns from whoever he's working with there, probably the Great Council directly, is, by the way, you're part Minbari and we're part human, or whatever. Um, we also learn about, uh, more specifically, what the prophecy is, the two sides of our spirit must unite in order to fight the coming darkness. Uh, this is not the first time they have hinted that there is some great power looming in the future. We've already seen this with whoever it is that's backing Mr. Morden and his deals with Londo and the the interference that's been happening with regards to the uh, the Narn and the Centauri. So we know there's some other player out there, and Jakar has actually gone out on his own to try and figure out what the hell. The, uh... Um... 
I do like the fact that the mystery behind the Battle of the Line was not only paid off in a rather awesome way, but they made us what I consider to be a satisfying explanation for why they kept the mystery out of character in addition to in character. I mean, out of character, of course, we keep the mystery. But too often a mystery will be made out of character in ways that doesn't make sense in character, just because the writers want to have the twist. Uh, in this case, it makes perfect sense that they'd keep this quiet. After all, let's be honest with ourselves, there are Minbari who don't uh, appreciate or understand or care about that, and there are Minbari who wouldn't accept that. And this is not quite a spoiler, but in the future when this becomes a little more common knowledge, there are Minbari who still don't give a damn, regardless of that. And then you might say, well, what about the whole Minbari, you know, ape must not kill ape thing? We've seen in this episode where a Membari is very close to willing to kill another Membari. He doesn't actually do it, but he was more than willing to threaten him, and he was clearly thinking about it by his portrayal, because this was so, one of the ones who betrayed him and his people, one of the Grey Council and their secrets and all that fun stuff. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. The, uh, the other thing I want to talk about with the Battle of the Line reveal is the fact that... Uh, some people took issue with the idea of souls existing in a science fiction work, which I just roll my eyes out. I'm sorry, I know you guys hate me for my opinions, you hate everything about me, but for me, uh, I don't really drive a hard dividing line between fantasy and science fiction like most people do. And I've always found it to be a little silly in some cases too that people will accept, for example, psychic powers or telepathy or all-powerful energy beings or whatever in science fiction, and yet say that the concept of a soul is draw is going over the line. Now, obviously, there's some real-world implications there, too, and I don't want to say I'm calling anyone out there whose opinion on this matter is dumb. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that. I just don't get it. To me, I don't understand the significance. But JMS himself had to actually go out and defend the soul thing. Um, and I like that, because JMS himself is, an, is a, uh, a publicly admitted atheist. But regardless, JMS, his big defense of this, and I like this, was just because the Mimbari believe in souls doesn't mean they are souls. Do you think the fact that a people have a religion suddenly means that that makes it not a science fiction work? And I like that defense. And so I offer it to you as well. <clears throat> Uh, I love the very human interactions in this episode. A lot of that sits on Bruce Brox, Brox, Box Lightner. He has such a weird name. Um, Sheridan. A lot of that shits on, sits on Sheridan. He has this great scene where uh, he's talking about how he hasn't had oranges in like three years. And a uh, shower with water. With real, actual water. Oh my god. And I love that because that's so human. And it's it's kind of like that uh, the socks and the, and the zip-up and belt uh, discussion that Garibaldi and Sinclair had before. But it also makes perfect sense. You're on a military ship for long, period duty, long periods of duty out in the rim. You're probably going to be missing things that we take for granted in everyday life. I mean, imagine for a moment, because I've been here in my real life. Imagine if you had to go without a shower for five months. Yeah, I've done that. It was unpleasant. It was horrible, actually. And you get to the point where that one shower... I remember to this day... I know this is kind of a weird thing to talk about, but I remember to this day my first shower after those five months. I still recall it. I just sat in there for like an hour, like... Aah. So I, I love the simple humanism of, oh my god, I get a real shower. Oh my goodness, this is great. Oh, and they've got oranges. I love it. Um, <clears throat> it really helps to flesh out the human in addition to the commander. And as a writer, that's the other reason I like those scenes. I also like how there's a fairly natural rapport between Ivanova and Sheridan. The actors don't have great chemistry, not yet, and uh, it's a bit of a shame. Some actors automatically just, they have great chemistry right there, get together on screen, no establishment necessary. Uh, the, the uh, I suddenly can't think of it, Garrett Wong and uh, McNeil. You know, Harry Kim and Tom Paris over on Voyager. Those two actors, the moment they got together, bam! Immediate chemistry. It worked great. Uh, there are a few examples like that. Actually, uh, Gates McFadden and Patrick Stewart were another excellent example of two characters that there's bam! Immediate chemistry and it worked really well. Uh, so, it's a shame that these two will have to work together to make that actual chemistry between the actors work, and I do think they get there eventually. But you can tell there's a lot of natural... The two characters bounce off each other well. Ivanova and Sheridan, regardless of the actors, do bounce off each other in a, in a good way, and it shows uh, the working relationship that will continue to be working in the future. 
Um, I'm gonna skip over that discussion just real quick. Uh, I mentioned the ape shall not kill ape. This episode really helps to emphasize something that I've been pointing out ever, ever since it really came up, and you guys have probably been picking up on as well, the, that, the, that the series has been trying to portray. The fact that the Great Council is not unified, that the Membari as a whole are not unified. They try to portray a unified front, and with obvious reasons, but internally they've got issues already, and those issues are starting to get worse. Uh, this is a probably a really good time to talk about the Starkiller thing. So they don't show it in this episode, but I'm going to go ahead and spoil for you a little bit of a detail about the battle where they took out the Black Star. <laughs> so the Black Star, um, here's, here's what went down, for those of you who haven't seen this. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be summarizing. I'm not going to go over every little detail. They show this entire battle in detail later on. Um, so the Black Star is on approach, and it's not actually uh, a military vessel. And there's some other reasons why they did this, but basically... Uh, they... What? It, sorry, I just had a message pop up. Ah, lost train of thought. The Black Star shows up. I'm very human too. I'm a flawed wreck. Um, <laughs> and they had... Okay, so what actually happened was they were sending out a fake distress signal to try and lure human ships in in order to kill humans because they were mandated to genocide the human race. Slaughter them all, no mercy. Um... What ended up happening was they they crippled the ship that uh, Sheridan was commanding. I don't actually remember if that was the Agamemnon off the top of my head or not, but they crippled the ship and then left, assuming they were dead. He realized he could do something to get back at them, so he mines, he lays the nuclear mines uh, in the field and then sends out a distress call. Now. This is this is the really messed up part because he sends out a distress call knowing the Mimbari will come back to kill them. No mercy. Kill them all. And the Mimbari come back and the ship is destroyed by the mines. Now, as you might imagine, the Mimbari are incredibly pissed at Sheridan for this. Violently, horrifically, just absolutely aggravated at him for this. Now, if you don't understand why, allow me to give you an insight into Mimbari uh, in, uh, me mentality. Really, the actions of the Trigari in this episode really help to define Mimbari philosophy in, like, one little window. For them, they couldn't kill the humans to provoke them into fighting. That would have brought war to their people. That would have brought them dishonor. They couldn't kill themselves. Well, at least, at least for the most part, they, they were believing they couldn't kill themselves because then they would die dishonorable deaths. And they couldn't go home because they were exiled. They were between a rock and a hard place. But... But if we trick the humans into attacking us, we can defend ourselves and die as martyrs. And then we will die with honor. The only reason they ended up finally actually committing suicide was because they literally had no choice. Disabled ship, weren't willing to attack their own people, weren't willing to attack the humans, so at that point suicide was the only option remaining. Now, that says everything about Min Minbari culture it needs to. For them... That honor concept, which I like to call fake honor, is the entire concept of this is what is considered demanded by the culture, by the people, by the society, by your civilization. This is what has to happen. We have been ordered to wipe out this race down to a man, and therefore that is honorable. We have, are allowed to do whatever is necessary to accomplish this because it doesn't matter what deplorable, disgusting tactics we use, whether we cheat or not what matters is that we are doing this because we are in because it is correct for us to do this we would not receive these orders if these orders were not correct therefore we are doing the honorable thing in, in accomplishing these orders however it is necessary to do so it is dishonorable for the enemy to defeat us in this matter after all we are right we have the correct orders from the correct source to do the right thing you are opposing us you are in the wrong now, this is not all of the Membari thing, and I, I, wanna, I don't want to say, say as if I'm speaking for all Membari ever. There are obviously Membari who don't agree with this. And one of the more common things was that a lot of Membari started to get more and more respect for the humans as they kept fighting them, because the humans fought with real honor instead of fake honor. <clears throat> but the point is, the reason the Membari still hate Sheridan is because he won one. Because he wasn't allowed to win one. Because he wasn't supposed to win one. Because... It was wrong of him to use dirty-handed tactics while defending the wrong position. 
whereas it was right for them to use dirty-handed tactics to defend the correct position. They were right, he was wrong. And that's really all it boils down to. However, I would be remiss if I did not also add that the Mimbari do not like to lose. In this way, I could easily parallel them to a lot of my audience by saying Mass Effect. The, the Mimbari are in many ways like the Asari. Or it would be more accurate to say, the Asari were actually inspired by the Membari, and this is true, they were. A lot of aspects of Mass Effect were actually openly, they, they openly admit this, were inspired by Babylon 5. And the Asari have the exact same thing going, don't they? What we do is okay because we're better than you. We're above you. We are, it is expected for us to excel. Therefore, it is only noteworthy when you defeat us, and that's dishonorable because y you can just see it, can't you? Just replace the Mimbari with Asari, and it fits, doesn't it? Personally, I just want to smack the Mimbari, but you know. Anyways, <clears throat> let's talk about uh, uh, Robin Socks. First of all, Robin Socks, I don't know how to pronounce the name. Is it Sax or Socks? I've never known this. Regardless, I have tremendous respect for the band. I've liked him in basically everything I've ever seen him in, and I am still to this day sad that he has passed on. It is a damn shame that we lost the man, and it sucks. Seeing him in action, in live action, just kind of the first time he showed up, I just... <laughs> There's just that moment of, oh! Because, yeah. So, a moment of silence, if I, if I may, for Robin Sox. Um, Ivanova's comment about Earth Force One is actually uh, very logical when you think about her character. Because on the face of it, why is she so bothered by this? Oh no, someone assassinated the president. whoop de crap We're Ru uh, I'm Russian. We change allegiances all the time. You know, I mean, come on, who gives a damn, right? The thing is, her comment really helps highlight us. And she says this almost a little too obviously in the episode. It's not the fact that Earth Force One was destroyed, although that was a big tragedy, of course. It was the fact that there was nothing she could do about it. Ivanova, more than anything else, is a woman who personifies action. She likes to do. She likes to be in control of her situation so that she can defend or protect or help or do whatever it is she needs to do. To watch helplessly is probably one of the worst things imaginable for her. Especially since she had to watch helplessly for so long with her mother. So to be able to just watch helplessly as Earth Force One is obliterated had to have really struck her to the core. I like how Sheridan really differentiates himself between Sinclair in this episode. I've already mentioned a few ways uh, earlier, but again, that whole commander aspect. There are several points in this episode where he puts the pieces together tactically very quickly. And he is able to outthink his opponents several times. I shouldn't say opponents, the other people in the episode several times. And I like that. It really does show he is the commander. The one who is thinking, uh, trying to think around the situation and trying to maneuver his way through it from the perspective of a military official. And I like that a lot. Um, <clears throat> there's several points in this episode, I'm not going to name them for you, where he does this. And he does a really, really good job of it. There's also a fairly great scene with Lanier. Uh, there's actually a few great scenes with Lanier, but honestly, the one scene that absolutely sells it for me is, and I'm going to paraphrase this here a little bit, if you're going to kill me, then do so. Otherwise, I have considerable work to do. Yeah, that's Lanier, right there, in a nutshell. That is just exactly perfect, and I love it. <laughs> Nothing else to add, just, just that quote. Um... I also want to mention that the Mimbari false flag operation here is actually terribly planned. I don't think it would have accomplished, succeeded even if Sheridan hadn't been able to, to guess their game because they obviously... I, I, what I'm trying to say here is that I get the impression that the Mimbari are not used to, to be blunt, tactics. That they're not used to having to be cunning. They're not used to having to outthink their opponents. They're sitting at the top of the heap militarily, with the backing of the Vorlon, I might add. And so they haven't really had to do things like maneuver through a situation or outthink an opponent all that often. And I mention that because, granted, I'm a tactical idiot. But from my perspective, their tactics in this episode are pathetic and incredibly easy to guess and talk around. I don't want to diminish Sheridan for figuring it out so quickly and easily. That's not the point I'm trying to get across. I'm trying to say I think that was an in-character decision to showcase that these Mimbari hadn't really thought it through all that well. 
They were just desperate for whatever chance at reclaiming their honor that they could. And they just leapt on it as soon as they, they were capable. Uh, so there's a character that's introduced in this episode called Warren Keffer. Now, I'm going to really, really smile if some of you out there say, Who? Please tell me some of you say that. Please, that would really make my day. Don't, don't lie about it. But if anybody out there's reaction was just, Who? That's awesome. So Warren Keffer is the hotshot pilot idiot. He's got like three scenes to himself. And he's boring and poorly written and rarely has anything to actually do with anything. And basically only has one significant contribution to the plot ever across the entire series. Now all of this makes sense when you find out something that I found out while I was researching this episode. Apparently, the studio told uh, JMS, hey... We want a Han Solo type character. We want some hotshot pilot who can be cocky and, and, and be an entertaining character for people to relate to. And JMS said, uh, okay. And thus is Warren uh, Keffer born. And he's, I keep wanting to say Warren Spector. And thus Warren Keffer is born. And it's <coughs> obvious, like he literally feels like a character that was taped with some scotch tape to the rest of the, the episode. And all the episodes he's in. He's only in like six episodes total. And, uh, and then, yeah, I just, it's amusing to me. Anyway, when I first saw him, my legitimate first reaction was, wait, who? And now, after a few seconds, I was like, oh, right. But, yeah. Final note, final note before I cut off. There's no controversy box, there's no spoilers box, no spoilers for today. Um, final note is, I like how at the end of the episode, they've already started planting the seeds for the direction Sheridan will have to go in. The fact that he will have to become more than a commander. Because at the end, he acknowledges that his very presence, his very existence, is a problem for the Membari. And he acknowledges the political realities of the intangible, which is what being a good administrator and a good politician is about. Dealing with the intangible realities of interacting people and cultures. So, the fact that he's starting to acknowledge that, that he's starting to perceive that, is a good sign that he is an intelligent enough uh, individual to recognize that there are things beyond the simple tactical. And I like that. That's all I got today, guys. Uh, season 2, woo! Hopefully we have the new intro, woo! I will see you guys next time.